sympathy. Um, is a long time um, instruct, uh, fitness instructor for us, has a gerontology degree, uh, works for the Allies in Aging, and is very well versed on keeping people healthy and happy during aging. And um, as part of her job for Allies in Aging, she works with housing issues as well. So I'm going to turn it over to her. And then by, hopefully when she's done, the other speaker will be here. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, it's so nice to be back at Pilgrim Church. I was actually um, a, the drop-in director, the lunch director, way back. So uh, this is almost like my home ground. And uh, so glad to see so many people interested in this topic. Um, does anyone know what is an ILCCRC and SNF? No, that's why you're here, right? Skilled nursing facility. Skilled nursing facility, exactly. So IL, there's a lot of acronyms when you talk about long-term care. There's independent living. Um, there's continuing care retirement communities. Then there's skilled nursing facilities. And then a category, what I call beyond. So new non-traditional uh, ways of thinking about housing, um, should your health change or you have additional long-term care needs. Next slide, please. <laughs> so just a quick question when we go to the next slide. Um, how many of you have thought about mapping out what your next 20 years look like. Oh, we good. We have some planners. Um, my work, um, I work as a geriatric care manager at, at Allies in Aging, and we're referred to as Plan B. A crisis occurs, and then someone is uh, hospitalized, a loved one, um, a mother, a father, a spouse. Then they are discharged, and they need a certain level of care. They cannot be discharged at home and then scrambling to find um, a nursing facility for rehab or support services in the home. So that's why I referred to this as uncharted territory. Um, a lot of us kind of know that um, we're getting older, but how to navigate this uncharted territory. I love this uh, quote by Lillian Rubin. All of us are now in uncharted territory, a stage of life not seen before in human history. And whether women, woman or man, whether working class or professional, we are all wondering how we'll live, what we'll do, and who will, I should put on my glasses, <laughs> will be before the next 20 or 30 years. So, Next slide, please. So this is this is the US system. Welcome. <laughs> Senior living spectrum. So um, as you know, the US long-term care system is fragmented. It's underfunded. Um, there are public options for those who are low income. Um, and then there's a lot of private options. And this, each one of these areas could be a lecture in itself. So what I'm offering you today is just an introduction, almost like an appetizer. Um, so it would raise your awareness and your curiosity, and then you can dig deeper. So we're gonna go into some of these areas. Next slide, please. The housing needs and desires of seniors is varied and may change two to three times over the course of later lives. So we talk, we're going to be talking about active adult communities, which are also encompassing continuing care communities, senior apartments, which are typically senior housing, such as Woodhaven here, independent living, 
assisted living residences, which my colleague will talk about, and skilled nursing facilities. Most important thing is that survey research shows that most of us would prefer to grow old in our own homes. And so you had heard about um, home modifications last week and then also home care options. So that is a consideration as well. So next slide, please. Start by asking some basic questions. Would I like to age in place or move to a senior living community? Do I have the money to support my choices? Does my current health condition support this choice? Are you confronted with a recent diagnosis or um, a chronic health condition? And what is the trajectory of, of that illness? Will my family be comfortable with these choices and be able to fill any gaps that exist? Um, most of us rely on informal or family caregivers when we do need um, help with activities of daily living or need transportation, and that's usually the case. Do I have all my legal and financial documents in one place? Um, my mother just recently died, and um, my sister and I started looking at her piles of, of information. So she had it all over, different file cabinets. So it took us, you know, at least a week to organize that. So just making it easier for yourself and your loved ones to have a designated place, a lockbox or something where you can put all your important documents. So next slide, please. So just going a bit deeper into the conversation, what is the reality of my current health? Do I have any limitations? What are my current fears and concerns about growing old? And these are all topics of conversation that you can have with each other and with your family. What do I need help with? Is it um, around the house? Um, what will happen in the next 10 years? How do you plan to address that if you want to stay in place or if you choose to move? And what do I want? So once again, it boils down to what are your choices? Do I need to modify my home? As you probably heard last week, um, do I want to be close to my kids and grandkids, to, to friends, to community, to your church? Should I downsize my home? Is it too large? Should I move to a senior community? So the most important thing is as you think about these questions, just having a be better for formulation where you want to go, what are your desires, and making those desires known. Then next step would be um, do your homework. And so I'll be guiding you and providing some resources as well. So what will you do if there is a trigger event? Has anyone heard the term trigger event? Yeah. So for those who aren't exactly clear what a tri trigger event is, it is a health crisis, car accident, recent diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, um, or some other triggering event that puts you into the uh, medical care system. And this is where, as I mentioned, um, a lot of folks come to us with their plan B. They never had a plan A. And so the plan B is to scramble, to scramble and get the services that are needed. For myself, I had um, a trigger event couple of years ago during COVID. And uh, in my 50s, I never really thought that I'd be thinking about long-term care and support services. But I had a perforated appendix and it went to um, Metro West Medical Center. And then they said, unfortunately, we can't do anything here. 
um, you're going to take the ambulance into Tufts Medical Center. And um, so spent a week at Tufts and um, had external drains put in because I had abscesses, so pus pockets throughout my abdomen. And when I was discharged a week later, um, as you know, in a hospital, anyone who's uh, stayed in the hospital, it's not relaxing. <laughs> they wake you up and things are constantly binging um, and the food's not that great. Well, I couldn't eat. It was nothing by mouth. So uh, a lot of times from my fitness reading, we lose about 14% of our muscle mass one week being incapacitated and I felt it. So when I was discharged home, um, my husband and, and my son, they were scrambling to find in-home care. I needed a VNA. Um, I needed a home health aid. I couldn't get out of bed. Um, I needed assistance walking down and up the stairs. I needed assistance with cooking, cleaning. And it was a harsh awakening. Now, the likelihood of something happening as you grow older increases. And so thinking about who can I contact, having a network. So what are some reputable home health agencies? Um, where is the closest VNA? Um, what are some skilled nursing facilities that you wouldn't mind doing short-term rehab? So identifying um, those service providers. Next slide, please. So independent living. So this is just a general term. Um, they're designed to enable healthy, independent, older adults to enjoy a lifestyle filled with recreation, educational, and social activities with others around the same age. These communities are often age-restricted with no healthcare services provided on campus. So typically what you're looking at are some of the 55 and plus um, older communities, but um, once you have decided maybe to downsize, um, thinking about what are the restrictions if you do move to a 55 plus, a lot of times you there's um, only a limited amount of, of time a guest can spend with you. There are certain requirements also for home maintenance. Um, any changes has have to be re reviewed by management or their board. So those are some considerations that you have to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So senior apartments, this falls into independent living and there are uh, a variety ranging from high rises to condominiums, um, averages anywhere from 1,500 to 3,500 per month. So the senior communities, 55 plus retirement communities, um, continuing care communities I would uh, put into retirement communities, independent living within retirement communities, and uh, age-restricted residences. So typically an another Thing that you need to consider is that there are varying regulations. So some senior apartments accept people who are 50 and older, some only um, 55, some 60, some 62, and some 65. So looking at the age requirements and also what do you need for a livable environment? Are you looking at a studio? Do you want to simplify, become a minimalist and live in a studio apartment? Or do you need more space? Next slide, please. So in Massachusetts, there's over 46,000 units of public uh, senior disabled housing and we are still at a shortfall. So my organization is looking also at what are some viable housing options? And I'll talk about um, a non-traditional home share program that we're doing uh, shortly. 
So some senior housing also have what's called enhanced support services. So for example, um, one of the senior housing in Watertown has support services where they have vetted home health uh, aides. Um, also, they've vetted other service providers that come into the house and help with some of the coordination of that. Next slide. Has anyone heard about the village model? Yeah? So this is part of a movement that was started in Belgium in the 80s. And it's designed around what's called NORCs, naturally occurring retirement communities. So this is the closest one here to Sherborne, Wellesley Neighbors. It's a membership organization. So you pay $300 per year. And then they have a variety of social activities. Um, they have a vetted list of um, plumbers, carpenters, anything for home maintenance, also home health. Um, and as you can see, they have a number of different upcoming events. Uh, the most popular one or well-known here in Massachusetts is Beacon Hill Village Model. So Beacon Hill, same concept, membership driven. Um, and it's usually staffed, one or two staff members and supported by volunteers. So that's something to look into um, if you are interested. And with my um, references, there is a website where you can take a look at um, all the village models uh, across the country and in Massachusetts. Next slide, please. All right, CCRCs. So what does that mean? Um, it is almost, I, would, I was gonna say, multi-levels of care on one campus. I used to work for North Hill, which is in Needham for five years. And so North Hill, they had independent living with a variety of amenities. Um, there was a wellness center, swimming pool, a uh, lot of social activities. Um, then meals, I think um, each resident could um, pick a meal plan. Usually dinner is included, but then either breakfast or lunch. Um, and basically come and go as you like. The only caveat was during COVID, when I was there, people couldn't leave even independent living. So they had to stay and we were constantly being tested. So that's something also to think about, especially now, post pandemic. What if we have another pandemic? Where do you wanna be? And um, so this is also called a life plan community. So a life plan, meaning if you buy into it, you start independent living. Then as your care needs increase, then you go to what's called enhanced living, almost equivalent of assisted living, um, memory care. And then on campus, they also have a skilled nursing facility. So that's what is meant by a step down. Um, the concept here is to remain on one campus and that's where you would age in place and have your service needs, your medical needs, healthcare needs addressed. But the thing is with CCRCs, you have to take a look also at the contract, that the contract may have what's called a life, life plan contract where everything is included um, or it may have a fee for service. So you pick and choose what kind of services you need and that's added on to your monthly bill. Let's go to the next slide now. So the costs of CCRCs, um, they vary and I'm gonna provide you with two examples of CCRCs. Um, Typically, there is an entrance fee, 
And it's usually the cost of purchasing a house in town or the equivalent of, of buying real estate. But what they did at North Hill was that you have a buy-in. And um, I'll show you the figure shortly. Um, but then your family regains about 90%. That was when I left in 2022. So, and then you have your monthly fees and they vary based on um, the size of your apartment and some of the services. So this is a website um, as part Massachusetts regulates CCRCs. And there is, um, if you go to mass.gov list continuing care communities, you can pull up their financials. So um, pull up the financials. You can take a look at some of them also have um, their, their bylaws. Some have um, the, the different prices that are currently available. And so just do your homework ahead of time. Typically CCRCs, um, they require that you go to your physician and um, make sure that there isn't a cognitive issue. And that documentation then is part of the admission process to a CCRC. Next slide, please. Yes. You know, that's a rough approximation of what the cost would be. Uh, can you uh, throw some numbers on that just so we can get a, a rough idea? Right here. Let, let me see. I can read this for you. Yes. yes. So it is, for example, this is North Hill. And uh, a studio apartment. Your entrance fee is anywhere from 153000 to 256000 Then your monthly fee is anywhere from thirty-eight sixty-six to over five thousand dollars. Your one bedroom. There's a variety of one bedrooms. They range from two sixty to over seven hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And the seven hundred thousand dollars they had, they put a new addition, so it's uh, very modern. But still, that's. A lot of change. <laughs> then your monthly rates are 49.45 to about 65.30. Um, the high end completely, which is one bedroom, two bedrooms, over a million dollars. And the monthly rate is also six to about 8,000. And that includes also uh, someone to come in and clean your apartment. For that kind of money. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So North Hill is a nonprofit. So that's the other point. So microphone, right?
So one bedroom, we're looking at um, about three thousand to four thousand dollars a month, which includes your meals and the amenities. Um, and so the co-op model means that once, let's say, you decided to uh, move out of there, it would go back on the market and you would get uh, the full asking price. And usually um, the co-op model means that the residents are involved in developing the bylaws. Um, also, um, they vote on any changes to, to management, um, to the housing itself, to any additions, to remodeling. And so you have a greater voice. Yes, that is Fox Hill. Yes, yeah. So this is Fox Hill um, in Westwood. Any other questions about CCRCs? So once again, this is just kind of an appetizer, a look at it. Yes? The previous example, did someone mention that when you leave the facility, there's some portion that goes back to the family? Yes, so that's at North Hill. Yeah, and I think most of them have that, but that's something also that definitely, if you're investigating this, that's a, a question to put on your list. And what, for, for North Hill, what percentage is that? Or is that like 90%. And that million dollars or whatever goes back to the family? Yes. No matter how long you've been there? I believe so, but that's another good question. And, and, um, these regulations change from facility to facility. And this this was what it was um, in 2022 when I left. So they're, they have a new management, so I don't know exactly. So yeah, yeah. yes. Just out of curiosity with the co-op model, it is, um, uh, if you're leaving or you have unfortunately died, uh, do you uh, Get the fair market value at that point in time what, for resale or what you put into the uh, original purchase? Like, like real estate, fair market value. Yeah. Yes. Okay, just a comment. Um, so, I, my name is George Moore. I work with uh, Sam and Health. We operate five communities in Massachusetts the Willows, Whitney Place, et cetera. Um, but my point was just to address the comment about how we work with this refundable entry deposit. It's true, again, it, it may vary in other places, but with, in our company, it's considered part of somebody's estate. So it's, it's subject to estate taxes. You can designate beneficiaries, et cetera, and typically it's 90% in our communities. Thank you. That was a great addition. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. Skilled nursing facilities. So as we all know, they offer 24-hour nursing care, um, typically who need a great deal of assistance with activities of daily living, eating, um, bathing, dressing. Um, and typically, skilled nursing facilities have special needs such as uh, a designated memory care unit for persons with dementia. So you could find yourself in a skilled nursing facility um, after let's say knee replacement for short-term rehab, but that's finite or highest level of care long-term. Long-term, the prices um, are quite expensive for nursing home care. Next slide, please. So look at that. Going up from 04, about $65,000 to 2108000 dollars In Massachusetts, we're looking at about $4,000 monthly for a semi-private room and uh, 15,000 monthly for a private room. So those are the figures. 
um, Medicare would only um, cover um, a defined episode, let's say that you had short-term rehab. Uh, a lot of times those who need a higher level of care um, do the spend down, but that's beyond the scope of, of this talk right now. This is just an introduction to you. So thinking about the finances of this, should you also need skilled nursing care? Next slide, please. So this uh, garnered a lot of attention during the pandemic. Um, that care suffers as more nursing homes feed money into corporate webs. So we all know what happened within nursing homes. Um, also, what we're what um, is happening is that there's more uh, corporate money going into large chains. So thinking about that as well when you identify maybe certain skilled nursing facilities in this area should should you need them. Next slide, please. So just briefly, I mentioned not-for-profit, nonprofit versus profit considerations. So just make sure you understand the differences and you add this on your list of questions. So not-for-profit is usually mission-driven. Many are faith-based. Um, they have the 501c3 status that affords tax exemptions. The earnings stay within the organization. Um, generally, higher quality of care, but not necessarily across the board. That's part of the investigation process. Um, registered nurses, higher staff wages, lower employee turnover. It's overseen by a board of directors. Creditors paid first, regardless of net income surplus. And greater mandate, mandated financial transparency. So for profit, driven from a financial re return perspective, not tax exempt, fiscal responsibility to investors and shareholders. Generally, lower quality of care, once again, not across the board, lower staff wages, higher employee turnovers, more reliance on aides and LPNs, uh, overseen by a corporation, investor shareholders only paid from profits or net income, and financial transparency not required. So just keeping in mind those two differences. Next slide, please. All right, um, so now going into non-traditional arrangements. Who here uh, ever watched Golden Girls? <laughs> I love the Golden Girls. So this concept of home sharing, um, I have a friend who has two other friends and they said, if in our 50s, we don't have a family for happen to be single let's find a house or a property that we can share and they did so in clinton massachusetts they found um, a very interesting living arrangement it's three separate homes um, on one piece of property so they have their home sharing dividing um, the, re the responsibilities of taking care of the house and supporting each other. So that's a non-traditional private way of doing it. Uh, something that my company, JS JFS of Metro West, is, has teamed up with Nesterly and with uh, the Callahan Center in Framingham. So what is Nesterly? Nesterly is online. And people who have larger homes um, choose to rent out um, like an in-law suite or a part of their home. And it can be for a reduced rent if they provide services. Um, all the partnering is vetted. So hopefully no one will get into a nasty tenant situation. And um, 
And they do have an online, it's called uh, nesterly.com, if you just want to take a look at it. So they're looking also for people with homes um, that would like to be part of the program, or also um, older folks who don't want to be alone in their house and would consider sharing living quarters with someone else. Is there a way to find out which facilities are for profit and which aren't? You could just ask. And on the website, they, there's financial disclosures. And you can go to the individual websites as well um, for the facilities. Thank you. So co-housing, has anyone heard about co-housing? So co-housing is a intentionally intentionally designed community. Uh, here in Massachusetts, some examples are Cambridge Commons. So they're individual standalone homes with a community center typically in the center. So if you move into co-housing, it can be mission driven. It can be multi-generational. Um, and each person is responsible for volunteering some of their time for maintenance um, of, of the exterior um, or being in charge of a common meal or an activity or something like that. There's also in Berlin called Mosaic, which is co-housing. And um, on your information list, um, there is a site where you can go to the website uh, co-housing um, a national organization, if you want to get some more information about that. Yeah. Co-housing oh, and the sharing in the ADUs next week as well. Oh, with more detail. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Good segue. And so I, so last thing, since you're going to be talk, uh, talking about this next week, the ADUs, accessory, accessory dwelling units or tiny homes. Um, if so, you'll find more information next week. Who's the speaker next week? Um, a woman from Acton who is in a co housing development. Um, the Callahan Center is doing the home sharing, and the Board of Health and um, is doing the ADU requirements in Sherborne and what they are, you know, what an ADU is. There's also information in your packet that I had handed out in the beginning on ADUs and co housing. Thank you. I may come back next week. So, um, next slide, please. Accessory, access, I can't pronounce that word. It's, thank you very much, dwelling unit. So, benefits of planning for long term care. Um, so get started planning for your future now. Go online and see what's available. I Hopefully this talk raised a couple of questions in your mind, um, curiosity about what's available out there, research costs and payment options, and then put it in writing. Um, tell others your wishes. Um, if you need to meet with an elder law attorney, um, speak to your family. And so the planning for long-term care um, is important so you can avert uh, crisis management. So having at least um, a, a plan in place, what if. And next slide. So information sources. Um, so CCRCs, there's an elder care locator, the village model, uh, housing consumer education centers, um, the co-housing organization, livable communities, ARP, and 55 plus places in Massachusetts. So these are all resources for you to drill down and get some additional information. And I think Sue will have a handout of these information sources. And last slide, please. And this is Allies in Aging. Um, 
I work with a retired physician and two social workers, and we have a team approach. And um, we are kind of the care navigators, so to speak, when someone does have long-term care needs. Any questions? Yes. So, to, to start out, like if you can move out of your house, what would be the difference between moving into an apartment building? And into independent living, would it be just that you have the food options or the social, social connections? Exactly. Good question. Did everyone hear the question? Okay. Um, what is the difference of just downsizing, moving into an apartment versus independent living? So, with an apartment, you're basically on your own, um, and and the independent living, there are some, typically some amenities and some services in place um, for you. Um, and But it, once again, it depends on where it is and what the facility is and what they offer. But looking into that. Any other questions? All of these options are, you know, fairly expensive. What if you have someone who's living on Social Security? What are their options? Good question. And that's that's a conundrum, I think, with long-term care here in the United States. One thing that um, is relatively novel is um, there is what's called um, kind of mid- Middle middle of the road cost. It's called um, to live communities that um, have that are developed in in Boston that has a lower monthly fee. And I don't know if they even have the entrance fee. Maybe someone else knows. Yes. And even the season five is the one two ladies list. We've been on one for four years. We've been on the other one for one year. If you want what you want. Yeah. If they'll call me now and then say, well, we have one bedroom that you want yeah. that. We want what we want. So mm -hmm. what do do? Yeah. And then there's also the subsidized units um, for lower income people. You have to be eligible and then you get a subsidy that covers your rent. And as I mentioned, some of the senior housing, they do provide some support services, but typically they don't um, really exist. Yes. Independent and assisting, and then you see you have to have more care and things. Where does your long-term health care policy come in? So um, long-term care policy, it would be just to cover the kind of like the nursing home part of it. So the care needs, not necessarily uh, the medical component. Start with assisted or independent, and then you need more care. Well, some people put you out, or do you start off and start all like somewhere else? There's. <laughs> If it's, um, that is one consideration, that if you cannot pay, you have to pay to play, um, which is uh, which is unfortunate. Um, I was just reading this morning that um, in Finland, long-term care is a universal right. It comes from the national um, health system, and it's a right like, um, as with any other medical care right. And unfortunately, here we don't have that same mentality. And I think our time is up. I...
two months to find another place. I said, so you're going to move me out and put me on West Central Street. <laughs> That's what I was told. They two months. So you have to be very careful what their policies are. Exactly. Excellent point. You have to read through um, the fine print. Yeah. And ask questions. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your attention. Thanks, Lila. Um, I also, I know I'm a woman that moved from Sherbourne to Linden Ponds, and they also are a CCRC. And um, in, that, in that instance, they, it's a buy-in. Should you need more care, they'll give you the step down and say you run out of money. Eventually, they have, they'll take it from your initial deposit. Um, and then if you run out of that money, there is a scholarship um, that will fund you so you don't have to leave. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Um and unfortunately, as we've been hearing, I get like, I start sweating when I hear the numbers because it's very nervous, right? It's a lot of money. And as Lila said, the healthcare system is definitely broken. And the other um, thing I wanted to mention was the nonprofit versus profit. We're seeing that right now with Steward Healthcare. For-profit hospital didn't have the same accountability as a nonprofit hospital. So always make sure you know what you're getting into. Now we're going to bring up um, Christina Broughton. She's the manager of member engagement and business development, and she's going to talk about all assisted living. She's from the Assisted Living Association. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to open my box for a moment. Hi everyone, I brought some presents with me. I brought something that we frequently go out into the public or we mail out every single week. I'm mailing out copies of our resource guide. It's just a guidebook of assisted living facilities across the state. It also includes some helpful information about like a checklist if you're considering moving into an assisted living facility, what you should consider, what different financial options are available for you. So it's all in this lovely book. I'm also gonna talk about it on my presentation today. Um, if you don't wanna take a book with you and you wanna come see me after and give me your name and mailing address, I'm happy to mail one to you as well. So my name is Christina. I'm the manager of member engagement at the Mass Assisted Living Association. I've been there for about a year and a half, but I've had many family members and friends who've lived in assisted living facilities for the past several years of my life. So I have some experience working at an association dedicated to assisted living facilities and also being on the consumer side, working with my family members, visiting them, um, helping them get situated in their new living facilities. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to give you my personal experience feedback and also tell you a little bit about um, what assisted living is. So we can go to the next slide. So who is the Mass Assisted Living Association? We are ourselves not an assisted living facility. We are not a community. Um, we are an association that's dedicated to helping advance and improve assisted living across the state. Uh, we work with about 240 different assisted living communities, and there are 270 in the state of Massachusetts. So we work with most of them. We go to the state house and we advocate to um, help improve services provided at assisted living to make it more affordable. Um, we also try to help staff. So we do a lot of resources and we go out to the public and we share um, resources for free with the public as well. So um, our mission is we are dedicated to supporting through advocacy and education assisted living residences across the state. 
we serve as the voice of assisted living in Massachusetts, promoting a model of care which treats all individuals with dignity, provides privacy, and encourages independence and freedom of choice. Next slide, please. So what is assisted living? So assisted living is a type of living environment that provides a supportive environment for older adults who need assistance with daily activities but still want to maintain their independence. So some examples of what you can expect if you were considering living in an assisted living facility. You could, um, there are uh, assistance with bathing, dressing, medication management, transportation, um, any assistance that you may need with the activities that you do every single day. Um, meals are prepared on site, three meals a day. Um, usually there is a set menu and there are additional options, a la carte options as well uh, throughout the day for you to choose from. Uh, there are social and recreational activities that are planned. Most facilities will have a schedule of activities every single day that you can participate in, group outings, and often they will also have committees where you can provide feedback and decide as a group what um, activities and outings that you would like to do. And there is also access to medical care and emergency response systems in assisted living. Next slide, please. So assisted living are uh, private or semi apartments within a community. Community sizes can vary very greatly. Um, there are communities that maybe only have say 10 units or 10 rooms for residents. Uh, and there are some facilities that have hundreds. So they're very different. I tried to picture a couple different types here. So over here on the right, we have one of the smaller, maybe a dozen bedrooms in the house. Um, it's more kind of looks like a house that you would just see driving through on the neighborhood streets and it's just kind of a larger home uh, versus we have one here, Brightview Canton. That's obviously a very large facility, probably of multiple um, spaces to come together, multiple dining spaces, multiple recreation spaces, maybe has a pool. Um, so that run across all different sizes. So it really just depends on what type of environment you're looking for. Um, most of the time, they come with um, your own bedroom and bathroom. Um, some will also have a little kitchenette if you want. You can even um, find assisted living rooms that have a full kitchen um, and a small living area. Um, there are also in the building areas designated for socializing, for dining, for activities. There will be many different spaces available. I've seen uh, places that have in-house movie theaters, um, libraries, large lecture halls. So uh, it really depends. There's a lot of different options out there for what you're looking for. Um, and there's always 24-hour staff available for you at an, an assisted living community. Next slide, please. So I mentioned this already, but there are 271, exactly, assisted living communities in operation in the state. It is a requirement to get certified through the Executive Office of Elder Affairs here in Massachusetts in order to run an assisted living facility. And they do have to go through a certification every two years. So every two years, the state is coming and auditing the assisted living communities to make sure they are running and functional and serving the residents the best way they can. There are over 16,000 people currently residing in an assisted living community in the state of Massachusetts. And we have most of them listed in here in the guidebook. In the beginning, it's listed by town. So if you're trying to look by town, there is a resource in the beginning of the book that lists out by town, but also um, a lot of information about costs per community, um, what services they provide, what amenities they have are all listed there as well. Next slide, please. So what's the difference between assisted living and other types of um, of aging adult communities. So um, we already talked about this a little bit. You already heard about it. So I'm sorry if I'm going to be a little repetitive here. Um, independent living, it's designed for active self-sufficient 
aging adults who desire a community and maintenance-free setting. So you don't need the supports with the uh, daily activities. You maybe don't need help bathing, dressing, managing your medication needs. Um, you're fully independent. Um, assisted living, there are two kind of designations for assisted living. We have our traditional assisted living, and we also have our memory care units in assisted living. So the traditional assisted living is really for um, aging adults who require some assistance with the daily activities, but still want to maintain their independence. And then we also have assisted living for individuals who have Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia, the communities are really set up to be a safe environment for those individuals while also promoting independence for those individuals. Next slide, please. Um, the range for assisted living varies greatly. So um, this is just an average range that I'm showing on the screen here, highlighted up on top. Um, you might not be able to see it, it says, Traditional care facilities have a typical fee of $4,000 to $8,000 per month. Memory care programs require additional services and may cost between $6,500 to $9,500. And that's just the average. I've seen assisted living communities that go anywhere from $9,000 to $15,000 a month for some of the higher end facilities that really have all the bells and whistles. Um, and I've seen some facilities that are closer to four to $5,000 a month that are your more typical priced assisted living facilities. Um, I don't see too many of the $3,000, $4,000 a month assisted living facilities. There are a few nonprofit assisted living providers. Um, in assisted living, it's mostly private pay, but those nonprofit providers do often provide a lower fee structure or um, different financial options that can help you bring the cost down, like scholarships and things like that. Um, some charge a basic monthly fee and then it includes all of your services. So some communities kind of have it all in one package. Um, more often I see the a la carte option where you have your basic monthly fee and then you tack on additional fees and services based on your need. So I find that's more common, but really it varies community to community. It's something that you would have to ask them when you are considering the community. Some of them also do list it in the guidebook as well. Next slide, please. And I apologize, I made this text very small. Um, so just going through what some of those additional costs might be in addition to your monthly rent fee. So some communities may charge for medication management and administration. So if you need help with a medication, which may require someone who is a licensed nurse or an LPN to help you with that, um, depending on what your need is. So there might be an additional fee. Specialty dietary needs or preferences. Some facilities offer customized meal plans if you have certain dietary restrictions or preferences. And there may be an additional charge for those specialized diets. Uh, transportation services. So if you need transportation to medical appointments, shopping and outings, those may be an additional cost. Uh, many assisted living facilities are looking for ways to bring uh, healthcare into the facility. So that's also something you can ask about if you are considering assisted living. Some facilities have um, actual contracts with other providers to come in and be able to do doctor's appointments and other checkups and healthcare screenings right within the community setting for you so you don't have to leave. Um, but some don't and some will require that you do go still to your regular appointments outside the community. So if that's something you're interested in, just make sure to ask when you're considering uh, the community you're looking for. Some additional things that people may charge for are uh, personal care services. Um, so some include this in the monthly fee. Others may tack on additional fees for bathing, dressing, how much you need throughout the day if you only need assistance once or twice versus if you need assistance several times a day. 
Uh, recreational activities. So some recreational activities may involve additional charges, like if the community is going to a sporting event or if the community is going to do like um, I've seen people go do like a brewery, brewing their own beers, and those may have additional fees because they're a little bit more of a costly activity. Um, and then premium amenities. So some communities offer a more luxurious setting where you have beauty salons, fitness centers, pools, spas. I've seen a lot of communities that actually have full beauty salon spas set up. Um, those often are additional fees to get your hair done, uh, to take a fitness class. Um, so just something to keep in mind if that's something that you're interested in and would really uh, like to participate in, you can always ask as you're considering assisted living. Um, so paying for assisted living. So as I mentioned, most assisted living in the state of Massachusetts is private pay, over 90% private pay. Um, there are a few programs to help reduce the overall cost of what it would be to live in an assisted living community. Um, there are a few options through Medicaid and MassHealth. Um, I will preface by saying these are not very widespread programs. Maybe about 5% of the total residents in Massachusetts participate in these programs. Um, for some of them, that actually might be an optimistic number. Um, but they are trying to increase enrollment in these programs and make them easier and more accessible. So that may be increasing and it may be changing. So it's always definitely worth asking when you're talking to assisted living communities if they offer any of these programs and if you would be eligible for them because they do reduce your overall cost for living there. Um, so some of the examples are group adult foster care, um, senior care options and program for all inclusive care of the elderly. These are options for people who um, can help uh, reduce the cost of the uh, services that the, um, the community is providing you. Um, there are also veterans benefit programs. Um, what it was already mentioned to you before, low income housing programs, um, low income housing tax credits. So some facilities have uh, a number of units set aside for individuals who um, would meet the criteria for low income housing programs. And um, so supplemental social security income as well. Um, there's more information in the guidebook about all of these financial saving options for you, or I should say, um, reducing the cost options. Um, some other affordable options that might help lower the cost of assisted living for you is some communities do offer uh, shared units or companion suites is what they tend to call them. So if you have someone like a friend or a family member uh, that you would be willing to share a unit with, there are some units that will have a shared bathroom, a shared living space, a shared uh, kitchenette, and will have two bedrooms instead of one bedroom for a single unit. Um, and that can help bring down the cost because instead of just having your own little kitchenette bathroom um, unit apartment space, you're sharing it with another individual. There are also some scholarships. It's really depending on community to community and it doesn't hurt to ask if they have any scholarship options available to help bring the costs down. Um, and long-term insurance. So some people's long-term care insurance does cover the cost of assisted living. Um, it's not very common. I think it's becoming more common, but it's definitely worth asking your carrier if that's an option for you. So if you are considering moving into assisted living, um, I just wanted to note some of the things that you want to consider. If you are considering assisted living, it is a very big decision because it is, um, uh, you know, it's a big fee. Uh, and so the first thing is considering the cost and affordability. So when you are looking into assisted living communities, you want to make sure you're asking upfront 
not only what the month to month is, but what any additional charges they there might be, um, what additional charges might be coming in the future if your needs change, and what financial assistance the community provides that might be available to you. Um, you'll want to compare the cost against different communities in your area. Um, every community is different. It's a different cost, and it's definitely worth checking out a few in your local area to compare the price and see what they have to offer. Um, and ask if the community participates in any of the financial assistance programs that the state offers that can help lower the cost for you. Um, location, choosing a location close to families and friends, choosing a location that has the amenities that you prefer, um, choosing a location that's close to the medical services and um, any transportation options that you might need. So you don't wanna go too far from where you go and do all of your appointments. Maybe you have a social recreational activity you do quite often. Um, you wanna take that into consideration when you're considering where you want to move. Um, healthcare needs, make sure you're very um, transparent with the community about your healthcare needs, um, what assistance you need with the daily activities, what assistance you need with any medication. If you're not upfront, you don't want to incur any additional costs after move-in that you did not know about before move-in. So you really want to be transparent about any assistance needs that you may have so that you can get a really well-rounded picture of what the total cost is going to be per month to live in your facility. Um, ensure they can accommodate any specific medical needs or accommodations if you have something specific that you need. Um, really make sure that you're upfront with them about that and have very clear and open conversations. Um, evaluate the services offered by each facility. Every facility is different. Every facility's ability to provide a uh, a level of health care is also different. Some facilities will only do a certain amount of um, health-related services. So they may help with some medication management, like opening the pill bottles and things like that, but they won't, say, do lifts, help pe lift people out of bed. So you really want to ask the community what level of care they provide and really think about the future when they're answering so you know that this is a place that you can stay in long term. Um, consider what social activities, the dining options, a lot of communities will do events where you can actually come, you can see the community, you can eat the food. A lot of communities will do events where you can actually go and try out the food. So if you like food, uh, like me, that's very important. I would definitely be going to some of those events I actually already do. Um, and um, wellness programs. So a lot of communities do really great wellness programs. And if that's important to you, if you are a person who really likes to stay fit and that's important, there are places that have fitness centers. There are places that have a focus on um, you know, healthy living. And uh, you want to consider all of this when you're considering which community would make the most sense to you and living arrangements. So um, tour different facilities, they're all open and happy to give you tours. If you wanna come in, um, you can tour the apartments, consider what amenities you want. Some will come with full fridges, some will come with half fridges. So, you know, really consider what you think would make the most sense for you um, and if it's accessible and comfortable. Next slide, please. Um, thank you, that was most of my presentation. Does Anyone have any questions? Okay. Question. I have chance to be a. Okay. Now, um, because my husband was 100% disabled, if I decide to go into assisted living, does Champa help me? So the question was you have Champa VA insurance policy. So would it fully cover assisted living? I'm not sure. If VA would fully help the champ of VA would fully cover assisted living, um, I would recommend asking your insurance provider. They're all different, so it really just depends. Um, they would just be able to give you a a straight answer. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Chandra, thank you. Yes. Oh, I see one in the back. Through the organization, I'm just curious. Uh, I've heard a lot of complaints about um, these fees going up pretty quickly and people being shocked and a mm -hmm. lot of people closing the facility. My question is, is there any regulation or lobbying that's being done about the percentage that fees can actually go up in any of these facilities per year? So right now, um, I know at the federal level, they are looking and taking a very close look at assisted living at the federal level. At the state level, we are looking at options to improve access to some of the programs that can help lower the cost of assisted living. Um, we, I'm not sure if there's any work being done on capping the increases. It is largely a market-driven um, assisted living is largely market driven the prices it is largely private pay um and uh unfortunately we are subject to um when the market goes up unfortunately the prices go up so uh, two other points uh is your organization that would you be the one that would be lobbying for um price regulations for setting prices Regulations. There's a few different associations that do lobbying efforts. Um, we do work and we represent the assisted living communities. So we um, are very much focused on supporting them and their teams. Um, there are some associations that are more focused on uh, the resident. So um, Leading Age Massachusetts, for example, um, they are a nonprofit association that really focuses on the residents' rights. Um, so we sometimes do partner with them on different projects, different advocacy efforts, and we will kind of go hand in hand with them on certain activities. We as an association are focused on working with the state on um, improving relations between the state and assisted living facilities, um, improving regulations for assisted living, um, and um, helping lower the cost for the residents in assisted living. Question I have related to that is, um, do any of the facilities that you deal with, um, when you go in to negotiate, go, when you're going in and negotiating, um, allow uh, you to kind of um, negotiate like a percentage uh, individual negotiation, I guess, in terms of this percentage increase. So the so, question was, are you allowed to negotiate when you go into the facilities and ask about the pricing options? Um, it really varies on facility to facility. Everyone is different. I don't think it's it heart hurts to ask. I always say, always ask. They can say no. Um, I can tell you a personal story. Um, we had a couple family members in the same facility and were able to negotiate a lower rate for one of them because we had another family member in the same community. So there are some opportunities. It really is very, it's depending on the community that you go into. Yes. Uh, you mentioned before that there was shortages of, of, of facilities in Massachusetts. Typically, if you were to go to one or another, you end up on a waiting list. Is that what they have? Waiting list? And is there a deposit on the waiting list? So the question was if there is a waiting list for many facilities and if there is a deposit on the waiting list. Many facilities do have a waiting list. There are um, a lot of high occupancy facilities out there. Um, there are a lot of new facilities opening up that do have plenty of beds, but we are seeing a slowdown in the development of new assisted living facilities. Um, I don't believe most facilities, I haven't heard of them asking for a fee to be put on the wait list, but again, that could vary. That could just be my personal experience. Um, having had a family member on a wait list myself, we didn't have to pay a fee, um, though that could vary based on the community. Um, but there are 
quite a few that do have wait lists for rooms, um, especially in the memory care units. So the memory care units tend to often have wait lists for beds. Yes. Uh, two questions. One uh, terminology. So assisted living is the umbrella term, and under that would be PPRP, which would be a, a comprehensive, comprehensive service alternative. Is that a fair way to look at this? I kind of think of, so the question was, what's the difference or to explain uh, assisted living and CCRCs? I see them as um, individual entities that are somewhat entwined. So CCRCs are kind of a whole campus of multiple different facilities. They may include an assisted living facility. An assisted living facility may be a piece of it. More often, assisted living is kind of a standalone facility, like a single, oh, it's not there anymore, um, like a single home or a single unit, but um, the campus CCRCs or other campuses are um, available as well. There's several of them, so. Secondly, looking at your uh, guidebook, so why wouldn't a place like North Hill be listed as one of the assisted living, uh, Organizations, uh, Some people um, don't reach out to us in time to get in the guidebook and they missed the deadline. So the question was, why are some people, some of the communities not in the guidebook? Um, two parts. One is sometimes there's turnover and we can't reach the right person and they don't make it in time and we don't have the information to put them in the guidebook. Um, the other one is sometimes you have to be also um, actively participating in our association. So if they are not a part of our association, they wouldn't know to be in the guidebook as well. Um, the number of people who are taking advantage of assisted living facilities, 16,000, that seems quite low to me mm. for the state. Yeah, um, that's not to include all the different other types of senior housing as well. Um, so there's also um, independent living. There's also independent living that provide um, additional services, um, but they're not technically an assisted living facility. And then there's skilled nursing homes. Um, but yes, it is only 16,000 people and it is growing. Uh, so I think Last year, we saw it go up by almost a thousand people who, you know, were added into assisted living facilities. The population grew. So it is really fast. Assisted living also has only been around for since, is it the 90s? The, so it's also a newer model of care. So it also hasn't been around for very long. It's pretty heavily regulated in Massachusetts. Um, so um, other states might have many more options where we have you know, 270 options um, because it is regulated by the state. Like I mentioned, they come, they certify, they come back and they certify every two years. Yes. All of the um, costs that you have listed are they for an individual in assisted living, continuous care, or individual living, or what about if you have a couple and only one needs the assistance? Mm -hmm. So the base monthly fee will always be the base monthly fee. And then depending on the facility, they may a la carte the, so I'm sorry, the question was, does it reduce the cost if you're a couple and one person requires none of the additional services and someone requires some of the additional services. So the base monthly fee and assisted living will always be the base monthly fee for the communities that also do the a la carte option for additional fees. If you require additional services, that's where the cost savings could come in for you. So if you have one person who really doesn't need any additional services and they're just paying the base monthly fee, um, versus someone who um, is paying the base monthly fee and then has a few additional services tacked on. So that would be something worth considering when looking at the pricing options for different communities. I will say most communities, 
do do the co-shared units. So if you are sharing a room with someone, it is less than just being in a room by yourself. They would each pay the basic fee, if you were. I'm not quite sure um, about how they do it for couples per room. So um, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Instance, uh, some years ago, it, it assisted living seemed to be that you needed, you were going to get like four hours of care during the day. That was kind of the standard. Is that mm -hmm. still the case, or is it now more you can have an independent part of this too? Yeah, so the question was um, assisted living sometimes is you get a certain number of hours of care a day and that's built into your price. Um, that's still true at some communities. Um, some communities still do, you know, the number of services or the time amount of services is built into your monthly fee. And if you need more above that, that's when they tack on. So some, many still do that. Some will do the a la carte only option where you really have the base monthly fee and then you tack on the services. So it really just, it's very, very community to community and company to company. So the question was, are any of them furnished? Um, I believe most of them are furnished. You can bring your own furniture with you, um, which is very much recommended. So you make it your own space, but um, they do come furnished. They'll come with a bed, a dresser. Um, if you have a kitchen area, I'll have, you know, a little fridge for you, um, but you're welcome to uh, bring in whatever you want as well from home. Yes. Uh, one thing that I found uh, with my mother uh, she went into an assisted living, and then uh, she deteriorated some, and one time they came to me and said, uh, you need to find uh, a place with more care. And so I think that that's something that people should look at. Um, when they go somewhere, because there are some places that automatically, if you need uh, dementia care, for example, they will automatically have a place for you. Mm -hmm. Or if you need to go into a nursing home, that there is a nursing home that they are affiliated with, and you get put to the top of the list. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise to me that when they came to me and said, you have to find another place. Mm -hmm. so I yes. Think that that, looking at places, check with, okay, what happens when I need more care? Mm -hmm. Because some of them are organized and have arrangements for that and others don't. Yes, that is a very good point. Um, in the state of Massachusetts, we have some current flexibilities that have been extended through COVID, but typically once you reach a certain acuity of care needs, you are ineligible for assisted living. So if you, um, it really comes down to what the type of health care needs you have. So it is very specific in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so if you, it's definitely worth, as I said, being very upfront when you're having these communications with um, the different communities about what your healthcare needs are now and potentially in the future. Um, because depending on the acuity of your needs, they may say that per Massachusetts state law, you actually need to go into a skilled nursing facility. Assisted living is um, not um, a place that they can take care of you by the laws in Massachusetts. Um, so that is something that's important to note. I think that's why a lot of the CCRC communities are becoming more popular because as your acuity needs grow and as your healthcare needs grow, you can transition into a skilled nursing from an assisted living facility or from an independent uh, unit to a uh, assisted living unit as your acuity needs rise so you don't have to move a whole town away or something like that. 
Uh, but thank you. That is something that's very important to note that um, you should consider. Assisted living is really for the mostly independent um, adult who just needs assistance with basic daily activities, um, getting dressed, going to the bathroom, eating, dining, cleaning. Um, so assisted living is for you, but then once you get to a higher acuity of needs, if you're needing your blood pressure checked, if you um, are needing any sort of medical interventions, um, it might not be um, the place for you because legally they are not allowed to provide a certain level of care at assisted living. Um, there are still books here if you'd like one. Yeah. And um, just as a reminder, if you're, you know, thinking and you've gotten all this information and you still are unclear, um, we're at the COA office ready to answer questions for you. Uh, Melinda used to work at a um, assisted living facility. Um, I've worked at independent living. Um, I work with the PACE program. So if you have, you know, issues that you're still unclear about or confused, feel free to call us or stop by or ask questions. And thank you to Lila and Christine and um, and Pilgrim Church, I'm sorry, and Doug. Doug, our IT guy. And um, the only other thing I wanted to say, and I just forgot, oh, next week. <laughs> next week is, um, like I said, co-housing, uh, co shared housing, and accessory dwelling units, and um, uh, what you would need to know if you live in Sherborne with the Board of Health and moving, so. Questions, feel free to reach out to me. I can give you my business card um, at any time. Anything was unclear or you need more guidance. Thank you. Do you have 